Welcome to my podcast, All Things Agriculture. I'm your host, Eric Carey, and thank you for tuning in. On this podcast, get to know those who work in agriculture on a daily basis. Find out what they do, the challenges and opportunities they face, and what they think the future holds for agriculture. You'll also have a chance to hear what they do for fun when they aren't working hard to feed the world. If you're watching on YouTube, please consider subscribing to my channel and leaving a thumbs up and a comment below. If you prefer the audio version, you can listen for free on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. And if you'd like to get into contact with me, please email me at allthingsagr at gmail.com. Thank you and enjoy the episode. Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to All Things Agriculture. I'm Eric Carey. Thanks for uh, joining me tonight. And I am pleased to introduce you to Mr. Carl Coons. Carl, how's it going? It's going well. Can't complain. Thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And you've uh, come bearing gifts. I have. Um, I wanted to make pretzels, but I ran out of time, so I just bought them from Wegmans. But yeah, I have a couple of locally brewed beers with some local ingredients. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, got some cheese from the local creamery, too. We'll have that in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Shepherd's Way, I believe. Yep. I don't, I don't think I've had that kind of cheese before, so I'm kind of excited. Yeah, it looks good. And uh, a nice a baguette, too. So. Yeah. But yeah, uh, so... Pull the mic just a little okay. closer. Is this yep. better? Yeah. Great. Yeah, so I'm, my name's Carl Kunze. I am from we- uh, Wyoming, New York, and kind of the northeastern part of Wyoming County. Uh, I got kind of got into agriculture and plant sciences through my parents and my grandparents. Uh, my grandparents, uh, my open Oma, came from Germany in the 1950s. Uh, and started a farm, started farming in the New York, Western New York region. And in 1960, they got their own dairy farm and they operated it for about, from 1960 to about 1988, I believe. Um, then they retired the dairy farm, but, uh, and so I didn't grow up in an active farm, so to speak, but I definitely learned quite a bit um, through my dad and my grandparents about some, some of the ways it was when it was when it was an active farm and that's kind of where I've gotten my motivation to keep going using my interest in plant science with agriculture. So the dairy, they ended up getting out of dairy mm-hmm. and the, did your dad do work in agriculture? Yeah. Um, so growing up, he, he grew up in the farm. Uh, but yeah, once, uh, he, he graduated, he went to Cornell as well. I uh, graduated in 82. Uh, he, he went uh, into banking. So, okay. Yep. Yeah, you know, so do you, does your family still own that original farm and the property with it then? Yep. Yep. Okay. Still have the farm and everything. Uh, I'll show a few pictures in a bit. But yeah. Carl's got a nice slideshow to show us here. Yep. Yep. I put some few pictures together kind of last minute, but it's okay. So you're from Paris. So that's a big, I mean, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a dairy. Yes. It's a big time dairy area in yep. the state, I would say. Yes. Yep. So, uh, where was your, when having kind of an agriculture background, mm-hmm. your grandparents having a farm, your dad working on it. Uh, where did you get that? You said you had kind of a drive for agriculture. Mm-hmm. Was that just from <clears throat> having that connection or was there more to it? Cause you obviously didn't go into dairy, you went into the plant direction. Yeah. So I, I would say the, the drive for agriculture kind of became more transparent as like I got older, but, um, I kind of, it kind of worked well with my, my passion about being a nerd about most things, <laughs> particularly like biology and like nature and uh, how things work like that. And uh, also my parents uh, did a lot of landscaping, gardening. We also have a, like a little uh, retail greenhouse business. Um, so when I was listening to Jason, I, I could finally remember as a kid going to some of their greenhouses and like kind of picking out the cool plants in the corner with my dad when we uh, go get plants for our retail thing. Oh, you'd buy it through G- some of them. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, uh, we get, we, we get some of our petunias from them. And so, uh, I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if some of Jason's petunias end up in my front porch in a couple of weeks <laughs> or not a couple of weeks, but yeah, June or so. Yeah. <clears throat> so for, 
you said for your retail? Yeah, we had a little retail greenhouse business. It wasn't like our main thing, but I, I kind of saw it as a way for my dad to have as many flowers as he wanted for, okay. for landscape. He's, so he has a green thumb then. Yep. But yeah, that experience was great because uh, that's what really got me into plant science and learning more about plants. And so uh, you get interested in plant science, um, you like agriculture, and what's a better place to go than Cornell for that? So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was a pretty easy choice for yeah. Cornell. Did you even apply anywhere else or nope. you, you went all in? Went all in. I applied early and uh, I got my acceptance letter uh, for early decision on my 18th birthday. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So that, that was one of the easier decisions in my life. Huh. That's good, man. That's to go all in, I guess with the early decision, mm-hmm. if it didn't work out, you would have had time to exactly. look elsewhere. Yep. But cool. So yeah, you went, what major were you plant science major? Yep. Yep. Plant science major. Um, when I started taking classes, um, I was really interested in everything, so even even the really basic biology stuff I found interesting, but uh, what I realized is if you spend too much time studying just plant biology, um, it can be hard to make a kind of career out of that and also do something that's a little more applied, so uh, I got really interested in plant breeding genetics uh, for one of the main reasons is that it's kind of like an intersection between more of your basic biology stuff and more of an applied field setting, so uh, I took a few courses. Um, I found a lab that I could work with for the summer. And that's the lab I'm still working in as a graduate student. So I started in 2015 and 16 during the summers. And then once I finished undergrad, they asked me back for graduate school. Is that Ms. Mike Mazurik? No, no. Um, Mark Sorrells. Okay. Yeah. But uh, Michael Mazurik's class is what really got me interested in plant genetics. Plant genetics. Yeah. Yep. You probably, did you take that your freshman year? Yep. I think I was in there with Yo, you. Oh yeah, we were in the same class. Yeah. Jason, <laughs> Jason, you and myself. Oh uh, yeah, I was right. a senior taking <laughs> plant genetics. It was the only, it was literally, it was the only class I needed to graduate. Yeah. It was, and it was, uh. Not that I was checked out, but it was kind of one of those classes where you don't probably retain as much information as That's I did fine. some of the others. <laughs> what, it's a in, very interesting. Yeah. What was it? What, what was your biggest like? What was your favorite thing about that class? Like, what you what was, genetics? Yeah. What did you like, or what, what? What was your takeaway? God, it's just in, genetics in general are so fascinating, mm-hmm. and how the whole heredity and I, I guess there's not really one point exactly it's just the overarching theme of i find genetics mm-hmm. very fascinating yeah and it's in cows very interesting mm-hmm. i'm very interested but yeah the whole same story of the natural selection how you know you put plants in a certain condition mm-hmm. some of them will mutate and they'll survive and then they start a whole new line or they they pro- proliferate mm-hmm. and it's just yep. it's, nature has a uncanny way of continuing no it, matter the obstacles that are put in its way exactly so like all that i find always really interesting and so um i, I found plant breeding is like it's like humans can kind of do that in a way with plant breeding is yeah like you make the selections and you go with it so yeah so uh, i work now uh, with mark soils i i'm my fourth year now i've been at cornell for a bit um <laughs> started in 2013 it's 2021 and i'm still here <laughs> Uh, Why leave if you're yeah, having a good time, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, w- I mostly work on barley. I have, I have two projects within barley. Um, one is uh, winter malting barley, so I'm kind of in charge of developing the breeding program for that. And so this this year is kind of exciting. It's the first year we have like full full plot level um, for our lines. So my fields are pretty big and I have a lot to work with. So there's there's that. And I also work on multi-use organic naked barley. So uh, naked barley is different from regular barley because um, when you harvest naked barley, the hull falls off kind of like wheat, whereas regular barley, the hull stays on. Okay. And so we're trying to find out how naked barley grows in New York conditions, uh, and that's been my job trying to figure that out <laughs> so is that a, a variety of barley that one is not native to the northeast or new york or well yeah that's the thing we you got 
none of them are. So you got you got to like test them out, see what does well, and then if you find some lines that do decently well, you cross them and self them down for a while, put those progeny out the field, and then you hopefully find something that works well. So see, see what continues. Yep. And so that works. Uh, we have pretty good success, in my opinion, with the winter <coughs> barleys because much like winter wheat, it, it grows better than spring grains. So so that'll over, you plant in the fall and it'll over winter yep. and you can harvest it in mm-hmm. mid, early summer. Yep. Uh, usually end of June, early July. It's a couple of weeks ahead, a couple of weeks ahead of wheat. So. Okay. Yeah. And so the naked barley, most of my naked barley stuff is just four minutes down the road. Uh, down in Freeville. Oh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so do you work with Ethan Tobin? Um, do you know any of the guys who work there? I, I've met him a couple times, but I don't know him as well because I'm always in passing or I'm like running, rushing there to take notes <laughs> and then I'm out again and then I come back later in the day because I forgot something. And <laughs> But no, uh, I, I, I will say that Freeville, they do like a really good job with the organic management of those fields. Like, they, they can be expensive for a research project, sure, but, like, they do a really good job. Um, and that's something you definitely need when doing organic in general, let alone organic research with yeah. barley lines that aren't always adapted to New York. So, Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, probably a lot of handwork that goes into, or just yeah. cultivating stuff to keep. Yep, so uh, with my spring, bar- with spring barleys I test, that they, they present me a greater challenge because... <laughs> <laughs> A lot of the lines aren't as well adapted here. And, of course, you, you make crosses to do that. But, uh, yeah, the conditions aren't always the most favorable for spring barleys because in 2018 we had – it was pretty dry for most of the year. Or it was dry for most of the year, like in uh, late May, June, and July until we harvested it. Then it rained on it, and that, that was really bad. Um, but – and then this past year was pretty dry too. So yeah, it was a very dry summer. So, so where where is barley native to? So uh, bar, how far back do you well, want me to go? Yeah, I guess <laughs> country of origin. If you really want to go that yeah, far, so you can do country of origin. It, barley is one of the first domesticated cereal crops. I believe it was almost before wheat. Yep, and wow. uh, one of the first products from domesticated barley was beer. Hey, someone yep. was thinking. Yep, someone was thinking. <laughs> and so over time, these uh, barley has uh, grown all over the world. Um, there's different uh, and like ancient varieties or land races, we call them, um, that are everywhere from Europe to um, Tibet to Japan, Korea, any any place where it's kind of a cooler climate for part of the year. Like barley, barley would have a hard time in most tropical places. It doesn't like the really hot weather that well okay yeah but yeah so uh, i i really like working on barley it's it's pretty cool um to work on hopefully on a crop that if we get a, a winter variety out will hopefully do well in the conditions and we can use to make local products such as yeah local beer using local malt so so is that the <clears throat> the long-term goal like what's the long-term goal of your research try to find barley that works well in new york yeah yeah, That's so essentially uh, what you're looking at. So for our spring malting barley, we have actually done that. And my colleague, Dan Sweeney, who's finishing up right now, uh, is releasing a, a barley line this year um, that he started with his PhD project, which is like really kind of impressive because it usually takes like seven or eight years to develop a barley. And he's done it in like five or six. And how he did it was uh, using this uh, process of uh, 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 using something like genomic selection, which is what you use in which was actually first found in cows. So we're essentially taking some of the breeding principles that are found in animals and just kind of applying it to plants. So if you could explain to people what genomics is for those who might not know. Yeah, so genomic selection is using kind of like the genetic information from an individual, like a a cow or a plant, and you make selections based on the genetics and not necessarily just what you see in the field or what you observe in the barn, so to speak. And uh, you kind of develop a uh, population for these uh, genetic uh, analyses by doing something like having a training set. So then you know what parts of the genetic information that you want, so to speak. 
Um, and yeah, so genetic sele genomic selection is a way of uh, kind of speeding up the process. So you don't have to phenotype as much. You can just look at the genetics and be like, okay, this genetic, using this statistical model, we can develop something called like a genet genet gen genomic estimated breeding value, which is just a way of, it's just a number that kind of quantifies it and you select which ones are best and use that. So a lot of what we, a lot of what my lab and colleagues have been doing is kind of like testing it and validating it. And so uh, Dan was able to successfully do it in spring barley, which was, which made the, the process, uh, speed up the process a few years. That's got to be kind of like groundbreaking. Is, is he one of the first or has it been done before? It, it's been done in other crops. It's been done in other crops like wheat for, for disease resistance and things like that. But yeah, it, it really helps the process up, speeds up the process pretty quickly. Didn't mind that much. Well, so yeah, even that genomic selection for plants is then even kind of different compared to how you do it for cows. Yeah, so uh, actually cows is probably the best case, one of the best case scenarios for genomic selection because um, it speeds up the generation time really fast because generation time for cows is quite a while <laughs> compared yeah. to a, a plant, so, so to speak. So, And the biggest thing compared to a plant and animal is with an animal you can control the environment and where the animal is. And so uh, you don't have, maybe you don't have as many environmental factors compared to a plant in the field that just kind of has to survive the brunt of the condition, so to speak. But um, I'm also not a total, uh, an expert in genomic selection in cows, so there's probably something I'm overlooking here. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting how you can use different principles of genetics across like kingdoms, so to speak, from animals to plants. Um, animals to plants or sometimes with plants and human genetics and things like that. So, so <clears throat> where do you see plant genetics going in the next 10, 20 years? Oh, that's a good question. Am I going to open a Pandora's box on you? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm going to say, I don't know. Um, there's, that's a short answer, but, uh, there's, there's different directions. There's, there's kind of like two big camps in plant breeding genetics. There's, there's, there's people... There's more of the quantitative genetic side, and then there's the molecular biology side in plant breeding, and it always seems like it's a goes in between those. And so, uh, I would say right now, quantitative genetics is on, on the upside, but um, especially now with the fact that you can use more digital agriculture and more tools to quantify things in the field. Um, so I would say quant like more quantitative genetics is where it's going, but. Also, um, we'll see what happens with uh, the new technology of CRISPR. Um, have you heard of CRISPR before? No, never heard of it. Yeah, so CRISPR is kind of like the, the next thing beyond kind of GMO, so to speak. So it's like, what, what's it? What is it? Clustered regular, regular interspace short palindomic repeats or something like that. But uh, essentially, uh, CRISPR is a way of you, have, you can be like really precise at where you make the changes in, in the genetic code. So okay. you design a thing called like a guide R M mRNA, which is just like a, a set of instructions of where to go. And then you can make like a, go to the, like the A's, T's, C's and G's, so to speak, mm -hmm. and like cut it or like get rid of that base. And then you make a change. Now, um, most, most CRISPRs are kind of just like removing that change, but, and you can maybe, there is some evidence of being able to like, through fancy pro like homology directed repair, I won't get into that. Uh, <laughs> you could essentially in sometimes insert a, a gene in there too if you want, but most of it's been just like taking something out. But it's pretty revolutionary because just of how precise it is. Um, with kind of your GMOs uh, through like the kind of agrobacterium, so to speak, you can't be as precise. Like wherever the agrobacterium mechanism kind of puts the gene in, that's where it is. But yeah, but for this, we can like target specific parts. So like there's specific parts of the gene structure you can target. Yeah. Wow. So you can actually say, and like you said, the GMO, you kind of, mm -hmm. you stick it in there and it kind of sticks wherever yeah. it wants, where this is like, I want that gone. Yeah, exactly. Del it's basically like going into a word processor, yeah. finding a letter and deleting yeah. it. And in, in a way, yeah. So adding. So this is like really good for like qualitative traits that have like a big effect and so um, certain kind of diseases in plants have this, like the difference between naked and covered barley is like one gene. And so that's great. 
But when you have traits that are much more quantitative, like yield, where it's a bunch of different parts of the genome that contribute to it, CRISPR can't quite do that yet. And uh, the process of doing it more than once called like multiplexing is not where, nowhere near that. So that the, the CRISPR technology still is a little ways off, but um, I know companies like Corteva and probably Bear slash Monsanto are working on it now. And I think they'll be releasing a variety soon with it. I'm not sure though. Wow. So will that be for your run of the mill corn soybean? That'll be everything that'll eventually. It has, or? The, it has the potential to. Yeah. Wow. But I, I, I don't want to over, I, it, it is really cool, but of course it has its limitations as well. Uh, I'm always cautious to say this is the next big thing. Cause that happens all the time in biology or some new technology or, or sequencing or like, some process comes out and everyone's like, it's going to change. And then reality sets in and it's like, no, it's a little more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Cause pro- probably one of the biggest issues is genetics is a trade off. Mm-hmm. So if you get rid of one thing. Exactly. You, you have that downstream effect where you unintentionally do this. Yeah. So like, of- that's why you got to really know your gene well. And so if it's a gene, you know, its function and where it works and what it specifically does it's great but like if you do something that's like more regulatory and and you're changing that 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 could have other effects as well so are there genes like within barley that are you know like they're almost useless like they're kind of not that a gene could be useless but it's like if we go to that it's essentially nothing changes yeah there's some of those yeah barley is like a Barley is kind of like really messy genome. There's a lot of like repeating things that don't mean anything. It, it yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of a messy genome. Whereas something like, why am I thinking? I'm going blank of what crop does well with this, but um, yeah, there there's some things like that you could try. But yeah, a naked barley, going to naked barley would be a good example of how maybe CRISPR could work in barley. But I'm not sure if they successfully CRISPR'd barley yet or not. So what would be like a big, uh, if you were to CRISPR barley, what would be a, a, a benefit that you could see that they could do by deleting or inserting a gene? Um, I would probably want to focus, I would probably want to focus on disease resistance because diseases in barley are, are a big issue. Like, um, we have a disease that's pretty problematic called Fusarium head blight and they, it, infects the kernels that when they're flowering on um, and it's not the fusarium that's a problem the fusarium it's the byproduct of the fusarium head blight it produces this toxin called vomitoxin or don mm-hmm. for short and that's something you really don't want in your food or beer or malt um because it's it's kind of toxic so yeah so we have our own like particular separate nurseries where like at when the barley flowers we inoculate them with this fusarium head blight and we have like a little mist system in there and then three weeks after they flower we go out there with our ipads and like kind of score on zero to five how severe the fusarium head blight is on the spike and so yeah we we want to select for that so going back to the crispr thing um if we could find way i i should know if it's quant if fusarium head plates quantitative or not um if we could go and add genes or remove add genes that would be have more resistance to fusarium that would be great um also i guess adding the naked cover that would be great because um we have a lot of covered barleys or regular winter melting barleys that are doing like that do really well here and the naked barleys their parents aren't as adapted so um it takes some time so if like you could just edit out the covered and the naked that would be great (laughs) but that's not gonna happen uh, anyways, because I'm working on an organic naked barley project, and I don't think CRISPR has much acceptance in the uh, in organic. Yeah, yeah. and or- I could see that yeah. they want to. Yeah, that's not exactly an accepted practice yeah. with an organic field. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, I, I guess we can pivot to the organic thing a bit because uh, I uh, when I first started my PhD and I was going in an organic project, I, I definitely had different expectations of what it would be like. Um, yeah, before starting grad school, I've usually thought of organic as kind of a little bit out there and 
some things are understood, but some things I, I didn't really appreciate. But uh, I've been able through my project. We we have uh, we have money to like go to different places. Like I went to Oregon, where our project lead is from. From so we they had an event there, um, talking about organic barley, and they brought like a bunch of chefs and producers and farmers together, and it was really cool. Um, they did the same thing in Wisconsin a year later. And this other thing that uh, we were be, we were able to be a part of, um, uh, one of my colleagues in the project, Lane Selman, uh, she d- runs this uh, program called the Culinary Breeding Network, and it's like probably one of the most incredible programs I've seen. Where they she literally helps farmers, puts farmers, breeders, and like the end users such as the chef together, and makes an event out of it. So like you can talk to the breeder who bred the grain um the baker that made the product from the grain and then maybe the chef that uh, has it at their restaurant and so uh all this happens um kind of in this organic community and so i i've really learned that a lot of um what organic farmers and producers have um and what they work for are the same goals that everyone else in agriculture has as well so So it's been a a good learning experience yeah exactly so yeah so I, I've learned to appreciate like some a lot of aspects of organic agriculture because they're doing a really good job at like getting people to care about their food or where it comes from and things like that. Now there's certain things that, of course, that I also uh, have a hard <laughs> struggle with a little bit. Like a good example is this d- d- disease resistance problem, right? Um, with conventional barley uh, or in barley and wheat, we have this other disease called smut. And it's a kind of a seedborne disease, and it gets sticks in the grain. And if you see it in the field, your your seed lot's contaminated. Now, in conventional, there's an easy solution: to seed treat it. Mm-hmm. It's, it hasn't been a problem, uh, but with organic, we can't do that. And so, uh, it's a repeated problem. And because you can't use like a pesticide or anything like that, you got to breed for it. And that's just like another thing to. That's another thing we have to worry about. And it, it can be really difficult. So that's where the, when you came back to the, if you could stick in disease or resistant yeah. genes, that would be. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just where it comes back to the good old mm-hmm. fashioned, yep. basically trial and error, just natural mm-hmm. selection, right? Exactly. And that takes a while. <laughs> takes, but, takes a while. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but also like the organ like organic research and things like that. I, I, um, it also poses like interesting questions, and that's one of my main research projects that I'm working on. Uh, we're trying to figure out how quickly barley grows in a given amount of time, so that the faster barley grows, the more chance it's going to like outcompete the weeds in the field. And so uh, to do that, I'm using kind of like aerial imaging with a drone, and I fly the drone like over our fields over like probably eight times throughout the season, and as of this week, I'm trying to like use those images. I use like some programs to stitch it together. Uh, I have like a colleague who's like the master programmer at all this, um, who made a program where you could like, uh, look at the image, um, draw plots around where the plots are and then take like specific values out from each plot. And then I'm working on like trying to make sense of it all and put it in like a model and things like that. Okay. And so, um, Yeah, it, it poses interesting re- research questions because, like, in conventionally, you just would spray herbicide and be done with it. But, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but the thing is with uh, something like herbicides and uh, things like that, like, we probably should be careful that um, we'll always have herbicides that uh, perform well because uh, uh, herbicide resistance um, is becoming a major thing. So, yeah, yeah. no, I agree. It's when you do roundup mm-hmm. on the same well it's one thing if you do roundup and then you put it into hay yeah you, you rotate but it's when you do like roundup corn roundup beans exactly. and now they have roundup alfalfa which mm-hmm. you have beautiful alfalfa fields yeah. where you do roundup 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 you're gonna select for you're resistance. selecting for resistance and that's yep. and that's gonna as you know mm-hmm. it's not like they just stay in that one field they start there and the next year they're in that field and they're 10 miles down the road exactly and, and then you have to end up using something else which is probably more toxic or yeah the, the older stuff is more toxic 
Yeah. I actually learned this afternoon that apparently in New York, at, they're kind of banning glyphosate at all state ground locations or something like that. Oh, for like state? Yeah. Uh, property, like yeah. state land and yeah. stuff? Does that involve, I guess, no, Cornell is private. They privately own that. Or is that state don't, involved as well? It is, with, it is state involved, so I don't really know, but it's like, it's dumb. But. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I think it's great. It's, it's, yeah, there's a lot worse chemicals out there that you could use. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but yeah, one of the projects is I've I've been learning how to fly a drone, which is like a really cool thing for my project that I'm kind of I'm pretty excited about. But at the same time, it's kind of nerve wracking because I feel like I don't know what I'm doing half the time. <laughs> Those drones kind of fly themselves, don't they? Yeah, no, you actually put in your own flight plan. Like you make it on the field and you just press play and do it. Um, you don't want to fly it manually when you're doing research when you're taking images because like you're gonna fly it unevenly and the images won't come out as great. So yeah, you, you want a flight plan, but. Yeah, the data for those drones now is insane. I know other guy like Luke Gene 40, mm -hmm. he was doing stuff with drones years ago. And yep. he was measuring, I think it was looking at y like yields and stuff. Yep. And it's like, wow, it's, it's pretty incredible what you can do with those things. I know, yeah, it, it is. But yeah, um, Hopefully, hopefully that would be cool that once I finish my PhD, if I can keep doing that kind of stuff, but what, what is life after a PhD? Cause when do you grow You have another year. How, how much longer do you have? Until Probably you're... another year. And then do you do a postdoc? I don't think I want to do a postdoc. You're done with school. Uh, <laughs> academia. I mean, some, some people really like academia, but it, it's, it's a tough job. Maybe I'm maybe I'm I'm definitely biased because I've only been at Cornell and Cornell Academia is the next in level of intensity. But I mean, you get I, the benefit of academia is you get a lot more freedom to do what you want, research products you want to do, and that's really interesting. But you got to write a lot of grants for all of them, and sometimes the grants don't get funded. Sometimes you have to completely rely on grants, and or the university isn't always support doesn't help you as an ag program like you should um things like that uh <laughs> tell us how you really feel how, how i really feel <laughs> i don't want you to get in trouble no i won't oh <laughs> we could get into it mildly so um yeah it's i i would say that um cornell needs to f can need to light the fire at cornell about making sure they continue to support agriculture based science because the life science is quietly eating away at the agriculture science, and uh, it's getting yeah, it's getting a little frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, Cornell was founded as a exactly. agriculture school, but no. they're like with extension extension professors are retiring, and they're not replacing them. Um, there's facilities that could be managed and things like that. So yeah, it's bringing back ag education would probably be a good start as well. Yeah, that, that's not. It would be a great start for Cornell. Yeah, ex yeah, it would be. Um, and they, they definitely, definitely could be some improvements for that. But yeah, they, they, I think they got rid of that program, the ag education program, like right before I started or something. Like yeah, that. it was. I want to say Kenny was like one of the last classes mm -hmm. for the ag education. They still and, have some classes. I, okay. I think Matt Perry still teaches some, but yeah, they don't have the major any or the minor isn't major it, Isn't it at Ithaca College, which kind of blows my mind? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because if you need, because they have more of a master's in education, so there's like a dual program. Oh, um, I see. Yep. Uh, Bray, uh So you you know Ky yeah Kyle's younger brother Brady who um came. Oh yeah. Joined. Yep. He 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 just. I think he's fin he's doing his student teaching now. It, oh, he, he is? Just, yeah, he just did that program last year. Oh, okay. Yep. Cool. So, so yeah, after mm -hmm. college, after you're done, what do you think you're going to so, like to do? I don't want to pigeon myself into, like, one specific type of career, um, but I, I really want to do something that's, like, meaningful and, like, exciting. So... I definitely don't want to just breed corn in Iowa. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> if or if breeding corn in Iowa just is like the cycle of more yield, more yield, it's like it it seems a little monotonous. But 
Um, yeah, I'd probably want to work for a company for a while to kind of get like some outside of academia experience. Um, uh, I've listened to, listened to some of these other podcasts. It's, it's really exciting to see like at, on, on farm, like trialing some things, seeing how well they work and like kind of this venture capital thing. So, um, maybe after a few years working for a company, I could start something of my own, but that's, that's just wishful thinking. So hey far. man, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta always have that in the back of your head. Oh yeah. Um, but, uh, other than that, other things I'd probably would want to do is I'm maybe work in policy a little bit. Uh, I've, I've noticed sometimes in, uh, sometimes with policy decisions that they're not always made with the right, uh, accurate data in mind. So, it would be cool to be at the table to help people make those decisions a little better. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes uh, Washington mm-hmm. and the people who write the bills, it, it, it drives me nuts is when they write bills or write laws for you know, recommendations, whatever for farmers, but there's no farmers actually Pers- involved. Yeah. Or even like you said, a plant breeder who's like, Hey, like this is bunks. Yeah. This is so, bunk. Or this is what it's ex- actually. Exactly. Like. So like, yeah, for those decisions, you need a farmer. You need someone who does plant breeding. You you need people who are out in the field doing things to tell you like that's actually not gonna work. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I I I am kind of interested in that because uh, uh through uh through the societies I'm part of, uh, there's this uh, program uh, gra- like research uh, group called Tri Societies. So there's like the Soil Science Association, the Crop Science Association and the agronomy american society of agronomy and they have this uh program where they bring like late stage undergrads or graduate students in a thing called congressional visits day and so you get like all expenses paid to go down to dc and they set up meetings for you to talk to uh, people you're like congressmen um about funding agricultural research so they did a really good job of like preparing us like what to say give us a pamphlet that was like easy for them to see so like i i found i i found that really interesting and eye-opening and i mean if there's an issue you care about like you can contact representatives but but it does help to have like a meeting ahead of time and knowing what you want to do when you're there so you did that you went down to dc and sat in with the senators and reps and all that or like you know the legislative assistants and things like that i mean the chances of you talking to the actual the the congressman and especially a senator, that's very low. But. Yeah, unless he got a, a hefty check for them, uh, yeah, to, to, to give them. them. Exactly. I'm sure they'll sit in. Yeah, exactly, you <laughs> right. But yeah, so for things that are uh, not uh, controversial, like ag ag funding, I can just say that like everyone I met in New York's House of Representatives in the Senate. It was like a no brainer. Like, yeah, of course we're gonna fund agriculture. So Yeah. Yeah, you'd be crazy not <laughs> yeah, to exactly. <laughs> that kinda of sounds a lot like the Farm Bureau lobby days. Yeah, it's very similar to that. We do. Yep. So But cool. I I, th- I am definitely not the expert in that. I am sure there are more people who know more about that than I do. Like lobbying yeah, started. Yeah. 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 I just did it once and I thought it was cool. <laughs> yeah, I did. T- Tyler and I went out and did it one time, and, and for the state for mm-hmm. Farm Bureau, yeah, it was it was it was pretty neat. It was right before COVID, so it was yep. like the last fun thing we got to do. Yeah, <laughs> right, right before COVID. <laughs> but we don't get into that crap. Yep. <laughs> so I was just wondering, did you want to uh, show some of your pictures or what? Yeah, let's let's uh, show some of my pictures here. All right, uh, I'll just press that. So, so uh, this is kind of like the prep we do. This is going to be for our winter grains. Um, pretzel? Yes, pretzels would be great. Hmm. We're eating quick, so yeah. don't mind us. <laughs> Very good. Food is essential. I'll put it right here. <laughs> This is gonna take a minute. <laughs> so it may it may seem like at first glance all our fields are really small. Like 
an, an acre is a lot to us, but that's because it takes a lot of time to plant plots as opposed to just straight planting one field that you just seed, seed constantly. Um, and so to the left are some of the envelopes. I think that's, I think that's like half the trial of my uh, big, like 480 plots of barley lines. And so they're all in a specific order. Um, based on the lines, you kind of like randomize them and you have this kind of field design, experimental design to control for the variation in the field, so to speak. Um, and that then in the middle picture here, you can see uh, planting. And this is kind of our, our planter. Uh, so this, the way I formatted this wasn't great because I cut off the important part, but there's somebody sits like right at this table and cutting out of the picture, there's this like kind of metal tray thing. And so you put a box in there, like a like these planting boxes, and someone on the back takes one of these envelopes, dumps it through this little cone thing here, and the seed falls through and is planted into the ground. Um, I, and so, uh, I have not done this before, uh, not because I don't want to, or, but, uh, it's one of those things where you add, it, you don't want more than one or two cooks in the kitchen kind of thing. Cause it's really complicated. So, uh, I would be very prone to screwing this up if I tried doing it. So, so you don't want to, can you dump a bag, dump a bag, dump a bag, or do you have to wait till the seat is almost out? You kind of got to it's almost out so you gotta really like really be it's paying be attention precise. yeah yep and of course mistakes happen a little bit so you will see the plot move but it it, it take it yeah our field does like a really great job is that in freeville yeah that's in freeville yep yep that's a nice ground too there's like no rock exactly <laughs> yeah the gr the ground there is is great All right, yeah. So these are more pictures are just this is more of Freeville. Uh, these is this is like my winter naked barley trials. So these are the kind of the plots that they're in. Um, yeah, this is kind of what it, kind of what it looks like. Um, I think too surprising here. Uh, so another type of trial we do in, in addition to plot level is we have head rows, and we usually do these because. Uh, we have a ton, a lot of lines that it wouldn't really be feasible, um, or we don't have enough resources to put in plots, or, or the must seed yet rather, and so we put in these little head rows, and so you can take some notes on them like disease resistance, like height, um, heading date is when when the the barley head comes out of the boot, um, and maturity. Uh, one of the other things that we we did last year and we'll be doing again this year is we're doing these like germination tests, um. I think I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, I'll explain what the germination test later. Uh, but yeah, so uh, when we harvest these, uh, we we all get our rice knives out, and for each head row, you kind of like slit it. You slit one head row, put it next to a bag, and then we have a combine uh, on the side that we throw it through, throw the the barley through, and there's a bag there. So I think I have pictures for that soon. This is more Freeville stuff. Uh, this this is the spring barley. Uh, this to the left. This is when the spring barley actually did well for once. Or the spring or the spring regular spring barley does fine, but organic spring barley uh, doesn't usually do this well. So this was this is also Freeville. And on the right, you can see our spring barley trial. And I I don't know how well the resolution is, but notice all the weeds. Oh wow. Yeah, if you look closely, it's it's, it's kind barley, of there's barley right there, yeah, right? Yeah, but there's yeah, wow, there's a bunch of weeds. I think that's different. Yeah. That is that the biggest trouble with the organic spring? It's just the weed weeds. pressure yeah. is unbelievable. Because like when you plant the later, so the later you plant, the worse it's gonna. Well, if you can't plant too early, but the later you plant, the worse it's gonna be because um, the later you till up the soil, the more exposure those weed seeds have. So, uh, one thing that a barley has is because it has a larger seed has more reserves early on to grow, but the weeds will catch up. It's particularly with the spring barleys. Yeah, so um, you kind of just got to do that by hand. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have weed whackers. You can go in between the rows, but yeah, no, between the head rows, you, unless you cut the weed whacker lines really short, which I, I'm the only one I feel comfortable doing that with. <laughs> because It's your project. It's my project yeah. and I know how to do it. But otherwise, <laughs> you're pulling some of the weeds out by hand. 
So is that, uh, um, so germination time is like a mm-hmm. big. I mean, yeah, in a way, but there's, I haven't really measured that as much because it's not really much you can do. Like we planted some of our barley down at Freeville last week and I actually haven't checked to see how it's doing, but can't really do much when the weather's. Yeah. Yeah. Junk. We, yeah. Once, once it's out in the field, it's. You can do some things for nutrient management, but it's it's up to Mother Nature to, yeah, to grow it, push it along. Yep, this is my so this is uh this is like my spring barley trial where I do the drone. Uh, the drone's right there. Uh, PowerPoint wasn't working, so the, this was a video, but that's okay. Um, you can if you can see the drone well enough, you can see the, the there's different part parts. Those blades, as it turns out, are pretty cheap. Um, because I broke one on my arm once. <laughs> yeah, we were f- fine. <laughs> I might as well talk about this one. <laughs> please, please. Uh, so last year when we were flying the drone, I'm obviously still new to things. And we had a flight plan and it was working out. And the drone stopped and it was done. So what you do on the control pad is you press home. And that usually brings it to the point that it started at and it goes down. Well, it wasn't going down. So it was time to get in the manual mode. So I, I did the th- I, I moved I moved it moved the drone above where I wanted to go and I landed at it or landed it. And then there's this procedure where you're supposed to do where you put the two joysticks in and it, it turns it, it's supposed to turn it off. What it did was it rotated the drone on top of itself. <laughs> and I got like really scared. I'm like, oh no, I'm gonna break this really expensive drone. So I went up to get it and turned it off, but I did injure my arm in the process. It sliced you? Yeah, it sliced me a little bit. And <laughs> uh, and I was like, oh no, I just broke part of the drone. Turns out those blades are like $5. Oh, well that's good. Yeah, exactly. So we saved the drone, but it, it was a kind of an embarrassing moment. And that is why if you're flying drones, you should definitely just take an afternoon to test it out. And uh, yeah, make sure you know what you're doing. <laughs> Yeah, I have. I tend to have many accident accidents one way or another. <laughs> They're usually entirely my fault. <laughs> but yeah, so that that's the drone. You can see the battery there. Um, there's these two. Uh, they're kind of sensors. They're just kind of. They're actually pretty sof- sophisticated sensors that uh, talk to different satellites, so it knows where its position is in the three D spheres th- of things. And then to the left is kind of like a calibration panel. Like when you take the images, you always want to take an image of a calibration panel in our situation because uh, the cloud cover can be uneven or it can be sunny or it can be cloudy and you want to adjust for that when you're putting all the images together. Uh, I've had days where I had to fly the drone when it was clouds and sun and that's been giving me a lot of trouble <laughs> in the past weeks. So uh, yeah, that's that's been a challenge. And uh, here's an image oh, wow. from last year that this is kind of like one of what one of those stitched images end up looking like when you put it all together. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So what what are we looking at exactly? Looking at plots. So there, I think there's about 20 different lines of barley and so they're replicated three right times. Right here, there's a row. Yep. And these are all all different yep. varieties. Well, uh or, there, there's 20 different varieties and they're replicated three times. So within okay. each row, they're all unique varieties. But then this next row is the same variety. It's just in a different order. Is that just... Why do you do that? Uh, so you want to do replications because uh, you uh, there can be field effects and field errors and things like that. And for things like yield, you definitely want as many replications in an area that you can do. Yeah, so replications are kind of like a field design thing to reduce the error for each, um, for each like trait that you're measuring, so to speak. Okay, because even I guess something even something as a soil type could yeah. change, and suddenly you're it, in a heavier soil compared yeah, exactly. to gravel. So, at that location wasn't a big deal, but yeah, when we get to the point of doing like variety trials, so to speak. That's when you want to test them not only multiple times in one field, but at multiple locations at multiple years. Um, so you can kind of like get a good representation before you end up releasing a variety. So how do you choose these 20 varieties? Uh, I did not choose them. They're, when, the, they, uh, when they made the grant, uh, our, the lead, the, so, the, so uh, at these 
kind of grants, um, there's often multiple institutions that are involved. And there is one institution that's kind of the lead one. So for this project, our lead institution is uh, out of Oregon State. Uh, they're like the real MVPs of barley um, barley breeding. They've been doing it for a while. They have a really good environment out there. Uh, when barley is, it's like dry all the time when it needs to be. Um, so that's that's always been, that makes it easier. So you don't have things like a pre-harvest sprouting or the fusarium problem. But uh, yeah, so the lead PI is kind of in charge of organizing everything. And so um, uh, the professor out there is Pat Hayes and now associate professor uh, Bridget Mines. And she she's the person that kind of selects the lines for what to use. And, it, and, it, and you know, when you do these projects, like we didn't have much experience in barley back in 2017. We've been only growing it for a few years. So like you you kind of just put lines you think will do well and you test it out because um this is kind of like a very early stages in the breeding project like you're just trying to grow bar these lines and see what does well and after this project is when we select some lines and we're going to make like a breeding population so you said it's base the lead mm -hmm. is out of oregon do they have a do they just want to see what works in new york like what's their kind of gain out of this right so they're I, so with these projects is that they're they're funded from the USDA like the uh, organic research and engagement initiative they're meant these research projects are meant to be cross cross collaborative throughout the whole country so like because they come federally funded they want grants that do research at all these different institutions so, okay uh, Oregon's the lead uh, we're uh, for this project so New York and our program uh, Madison Wisconsin Minnesota and UC Davis are involved. And so they also grow out these trials and it's up to us grad students to put a report together and talk about these trials and evaluate them, look at things like genetics by genetic by environment interactions and things like that. So, so, so yeah, so, so what works for us in New York might not work for people exactly. in California and Wisconsin and Oregon then. Yes, exactly. Now there is like there is some similarities in environments when between the Midwest and here, but Oregon, yeah, it's definitely really different. Uh, I would say actually some of the winter barley lines are kind of do okay, but yeah, uh, with our spring barley lines shown here, uh, a lot of them like I was just looking at this last week, the yields for the spring lines did really well in like Oregon, <laughs> comparative to like the Midwest and Northeast, where most of the time the yields weren't that great. It's because the drier. Well, I, I don't know, cause I, I I'm I'm not quite sure yet. But uh, yeah, just like when the rain, the, just the timing of when the rain comes or when it doesn't come, the type of weeds, the type of soil, all these things contribute to drastically different effects. Just growing the same line in different places. Is is Oregon? Are they? I'm not even sure. Would it be University of Oregon, Oregon State? Oregon State. Is yeah. that? on the west side of the mountains or is that on the east side like where do they do their plots because you have you know it's uh, a whole different climate i'm not i they so they do a bunch of them in corvallis which is just a couple hours south of portland okay i think they have trials out there but i'm not sure that's just kind of cool about them because they yeah. just go over the mountains and you can basically do a, yeah a, a desert exactly. simulation which is pretty cool yeah yeah I, i'm not sure um i'd have to check that out uh huh. But yeah, it's these projects. I, I was talking about this earlier, but these projects are really cool because we get to collaborate with different universe, different universities, different professors, and they all have their own ideas and so, ideas and ways to do things, and that makes these projects a lot more fun and pushes the research forward more. And I get to travel and go to these places. Yeah, like, that's uh, like that's... Uh, yeah, Oregon. Oregon was really cool. Like had a barley day and things like that in Madison. Uh, when we got there, uh, we went out, uh, the thing you got to do when you go to Madison, Wisconsin is you got to go to the, I, th I think it's called the terrace. It's essentially this like place where you get to drink some beers, have some like bratwurst out in the lake at Madison, Wisconsin. And that's really nice. Have like, have you ever had a spotted cow? Have you ever had, uh, it sounds really familiar. It's a beer, right? Yeah. It's a beer that's only in Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I guess I haven't done. Okay. I've, I've heard 
I'm thinking of there's another beer. Maybe it's some something utter cow something that something you can like that. get in new york yeah so like through our project we like were able to just go there for a field trip one day <laughs> and that was really cool <laughs> yeah because the nice thing with barley is you know what the beverage is always gonna be exactly or, yeah uh, oh yeah i should get into that uh what are the traits that we're worried about for quality that come to beer so um so uh when we're selected for barley once we get uh kind of the numbers down a little bit like we have 200 lines that we do well or something like that that's when we start testing a little bit for molting quality and so there's there's a lot of factors that go into that and that's what makes barley kind of tricky to grow uh because some of these factors such as like beta glucan for example are really dependent on the environment and sometimes the soil types um so that's why we try to breed lines that have they're going to be like really consistent with something like beta glucan so that it's not too high or too low so to speak is that one of the major pieces of yeah maltine? yeah beta glucan is something that's produced in barley and you kind of want it below a certain threshold if you have too much beta glucan uh the beta glucan gets gets really viscous and clogs up the brewing system and unless they have something like a like a mash filter or some but it and it's kind of expensive it slow it slows things down and you don't have as like much extraction uh other things that like we look for in malting quality are like protein like the kind of protein so there's like things like alpha amylase soluble to total protein ratio um some of this stuff kind of reminds me when you talk about animal like rations for yeah, different cows yeah, and things yeah. like that <laughs> it's very similar yeah uh but yeah the, the only yeah the downside though with these malting quality things oh oh and the other one is a kind of germination rate um so when we when barley comes out of the field uh it can sometimes have like a dormancy period so like if some of the lines if you're going to take them out of the field at the beginning of july and then three weeks later try to malt them they're not going to malt very well you just press it real quick <laughs> wait so they if you pull them out if you were to harvest them so and, if you harvest them just like you normally would yeah nothing special about that and then you tried to malt some of them three weeks later they wouldn't they wouldn't germinate very well oh okay yeah i see so uh, on that end of the spectrum we want barley maybe like a month after harvested to germinate well because if it doesn't germinate well that doesn't make good malt okay uh however um the other extreme is if it um it might germinate really well coming out of the field that's a problem for something called pre-harvest sprouting which i think i have an image of how we test that Oh yeah, we got we got more beer, and we, we we got cheese too. We got we got lots of stuff. Yeah, I even got candy if we want that too. <laughs> Great, Great. Yeah. So uh, on one end, we want a high germination rate after an, like a month out of the field, um, and that's kind of what we're doing here. We're kind of measuring that in these petri plates. Like we dump little thirty grain samples in, and we kind of measure that. But on the other end, if the barley germinates too well, that's really risky, especially in New York. Because then the barley might germinate while it's still in the field. And that's called pre harvest sprouting. And so our program has been selecting against pre harvest sprouting since for many years. So if you're a little bit too late to yeah. getting it, yeah. and then it's r- essentially ruined. Exactly. So uh, our, the spring barleys are a little are worse about the pre harvest sprouting than the winter ones. But yeah, we want to find this balance to make sure it doesn't sprout. It, like say, uh, beginning of July it rains. Um, one short time period won't be a problem, but uh, say if it rains for like two to three days straight in July, which usually doesn't happen, um, we want to make sure the barley still doesn't germinate under that conditions. And uh, yeah, we had we had a, in 2018, the beginning of August, we had that problem where. All this spring barley was like beautiful. It was like yielding really well. And then it rained like today for two to three days straight. And a lot of the barley got ruined. Oh, so we like, we had to go out in the field quite a bit and like take samples of what wasn't ruined and things like that. And that, that made our life very difficult. <laughs> so if you're growing barley 
for malting, it's you've yeah. really got to be on your yeah. You got to be on your game. Like once barley matures, you need to get it out like yesterday. Huh? Yeah. I guess I don't. I I don't even pay attention to that because I've never. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if we've grown barley before. We've really had no reason to, but that's mm-hmm. good to know. Yeah. So probably, I don't know if you want to go through the rest of your pictures first. I can sure, ask sure, you that. Sure. I can ask you this question a little bit later. Yeah, I I kind of got a tangent like normal. That's, uh, that's all good. Yeah. So this is what kind of like we're harvesting. That's 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 Dan right there. Um, he he's one to develop the winter melting bar or the spring barley variety. Uh, I should mention the name. It's called it's I think it's called a Celsius Gold. I think that's the name of the barley variety coming out. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like what our for com- commercial use. Yeah, yep. Nice. Uh, that's what our combine looks like. Um, it's it's definitely pretty small, but you kind of need that for research plots. It, it I think it's like, I think it's was made in like 1986 or something like that. Yeah, we don't have the most up to date equipment, but that's <laughs> that's how uh, that's how breeding programs kind of or small breeding programs work. There's definitely other states uh, that. Um, have larger breeding programs that can afford better things but yeah that's kind of what our, what our combines look like we have about four of them but i i would say i comfortably would only want to use two of them uh because the other ones kind of contaminate a little bit <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> yep and so uh to the to the left here is kind of our trays like we t- test this pre-harvest sprouting thing and the germination um uh, once barley reaches like process called physiological maturity that's like when the when everything the green leaves the spike we take samples out of the field um and dry them for a few days and then we put them in these like mist chambers in in the greenhouse and we miss them for three to four days depending if it's spring or winter and then we score them um and so they'll have like a zero to four score if there's only roots coming out of the the barley grains or and then maybe like a five to nine if there's a coleoptile or like green shoots coming out of it and so the highly susceptible ones have like are like pretty much plants already <laughs> for okay. three days but most of their winters actually are pre pre-harvest um phs resistant so that's been pretty good um the other thing we've been doing this last year which has been a lot of work is that in addition to the pre harvest sprouting, we've been taking samples out of the field for germination. And so we do about five spikes for PHS per sample. And for these germination assays, it's been anywhere from like 15 spikes to about 30. And unfortunately, with the with these spikes that we harvest um, out of the field, we can't put them through the combine because the combine will kind of nick the grains and that alters the germination a little bit. So we kind of like got a hand. Oh. <laughs> we gotta get like a, uh, gotta get a rubber tube together, staple one end, and kind of thresh these by hand. Um, and it's been a lot of samples, but yeah, we uh, do that. We we put them in little baggies, and then we freeze them until we want to start the experiment. And then sometimes September, we take all the samples out, and that freezing is kind of like a freezing point in time. And then once they come out, we we kind of count that as days after physiological maturity okay so uh we we count them into little envelopes and we put them in those little petri plates um there's like about three mils of water in there and we just score them after one two three four and five days we kind of count the rate at which they germinate and lines that germinate pretty fast are kind of what we want in this situation and we don't want lines that like germinate really slowly. I don't think we'll go that. We'll do that a little bit later. But okay. Yeah. So, do you, did you say you had a question earlier? All right, um. I'll just leave on this one right now. Yeah. Now I'm trying to. <laughs> now I got to remember what it was. Um. Oh. So, with all the craft brews, breweries mm-hmm. in New York, and I know a lot of the rules for having making like craft brew, brew, craft beer in yeah. New York, you're required to buy like New York yeah. barley malt, all mm-hmm. that. Is there kind of a big demand for 
barley more barley varieties is this one reason why you guys are doing this yeah, as well or yeah so um that yeah we get a lot of funding from new york state to develop these lines for this reason um so far uh yeah for the spring lines there's some that work well and right now they're there's other winter lines but yeah we're, we're getting funding from the state to kind of meet this demand so to speak yeah, there's just so many crap, which is great. I love uh, yeah. like this, like we're drinking, I guess. Yeah. You want to go into kind of yeah, talking we'll go, about this a little. So uh, I'm quite, so um, with industrial arts, the Yes Farms, Yes Beer, and definitely with the talking cursive, um, the malt from this is uh, produced from uh, Valley Malt in uh, Batavia from Ted Hawley. And he uh, does a lot of these kind of specialty malts for people. Um, and he's been like really helpful because he hosts some of our field trials like we'll go to his farm and grow out field trials we go to field days out there so we talk about what we're doing the field ted holly talks about what he's doing in the malt house and so anytime i see like um uh, his malt house on here i always try to get these kind of beers this is good i talking cursive it's uh Mm -hmm. it's it's not i like the yes is it yes yes beer yes farm yes mm-hmm. farm yes beer yeah i like that a lot this is good but i like that it has yeah. a lot more kick to it yeah 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 this is a lot more of a, a mellow mm-hmm. it's good though yeah there's just so many beers i know breweries there's one summer hill it's probably 10 minute drive from here they yep. make all their own beers it's good stuff and there's another one i don't know probably four or five miles on the road from that on route 90 yep yep going in i've been to summer hill before oh you have yeah yep yep okay yep yeah they're involved with the the owners of that work with my dad they're kind of on the board for the mm-hmm. ag program for yeah Gron, which you helped out at yeah so uh yeah yes, that yeah so uh yesterday i was here in groton again um so i've worked with a uh, uh jason oliver um he's an ag teacher um and i kind of went i went into his ag classroom and talked about like what are some of the projects I'm working on? Did a little bit of a barley crossing demonstration. Sorry, I didn't bring those, but <laughs> no, I'm fine. yeah, I, I did a little like demonstration how how to cross barley. Like, what are the benefits of barley? Um, one other thing, I brought some lines and I kind of showed them like what 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 does a cross barley look like? So there was one line that was purple and didn't have. It was like purple and one that was like more of a right what you think of regular barley and the spike it brought you could tell the difference by, by how they were crossed so i kind of just showed the basics and things like that um and yeah jace jason i know is because uh uh Jason's wife amy has been working in our program until she uh was working in our program for a number of years so um yeah, it's all local. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. I didn't, yeah, I didn't even realize that till we were, I was getting set up. Yeah, and you, you're like, oh, I was in Groton yesterday. I was like, what? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, really bright students too. Um, oh, good. Yeah, uh, it, it, the the whole steam project there is like really cool. Like that's that's some state of the art stuff down there. Yeah, that was a big. Uh, I don't know. A couple of years ago, they decided to. That used to be a whole six. Like when I was in school, that was the sixth grade wing mm-hmm. on the bottom floor and yep they had this envision of changing it over a couple of years ago and i guess it's been done, gone real well in the ag program jason does a great job yeah he's yeah. a great teacher and so that's exciting to mm-hmm. see yeah i i, I kind of want to get that for my high school at some yeah. point. and we're we're very fortunate the uh, administration is very much behind it as well which is you know something you definitely need exactly and that's that's good to have an administration that like is really on board with that like yeah that's really that's very encouraging <laughs> yeah it is they have a high tunnel. i don't know if you saw they have a high tunnel across the road and jason was telling me about that yeah so and i think they have other projects mm-hmm. coming up they're gonna try to implement so it's it's great i i think it's amazing i yep. wish we had it when i was there but yeah i give jason a lot of credit because jason has a phd um he has his PhD, so there's multiple things he could do, but I, I, it's really inspiring that, like, he wants to teach. For, yeah, 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 exactly. And, like, make an impact like that, so. Yeah, like, he could probably have a job doing whatever he wanted. Yep. With his, yeah. What was his PhD in, exactly, do you know? I think it was, like, engineering or something like okay. that. Okay, yeah, yeah, he's a smart guy. Yeah. I know he does a lot with mushrooms, too, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, shiitake, mo- yeah, they, they grow mushrooms. Yeah. I always... 
I always I always miss the boat when asking Amy when they have them because by the time I always ask them, I'm like, "Yep, we already sold them all." It's like, ah, bummer. <laughs> but yeah, essentially with that, you kind of like have to get certain kind of logs and you kind of punch holes in them, and then I think you inoculate them or something like that. I actually don't know the details. That's Didn't all I know. You, did you not do that with Frank Rossi? I never took Frank Rossi's class. You I, never took Hort 101. I know. I even I took that class. It, 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 <laughs> Yeah, like, I had a very weird course schedule. It it was very out of sync compared to what most people did. Like, I should have taken that class the first thing I did. That was the very first class I ever took. And I was like, wow, if this is how all Cornell classes are, this is going to be a breeze. Well, no, you get like, what do you get, like food in the morning, every morning or something like that? Yeah, he'd bring in, yeah, he'd bring in like the plant of the day and it'd be oranges or apples or pineapple or whatever. Yeah. And yeah, we did, we made mushroom logs and Mm -hmm. we trimmed vines for winery and yeah, we did a lot of cool stuff. So he's a, he's a very energetic man. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The shiitake mushroom. I forgot about that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not a big mushroom person. Mm. I didn't used to be, but, um, I, I, over time, I, yeah, I actually just used to be a really picky eater in general, but over time I've learn to try different things and now i'm really really willing to try most things <laughs> that's yeah that's yeah i'll i'll try most things there's definitely still a limit mm-hmm. if it's sure yeah like something i'm still not quite on board with is like things like uh blue ranch i still can't really do that well oh like blue it, cheese stuff blue cheese maybe a little bit but like ranch or like dressings and things like that i'm still like oh you don't like you don't like dressing well a little bit but not a lot okay i used to not like it at all but it's still one of those things where i'm like i don't know it's one of those weird things that's that's a different Mm -hmm. one Mm -hmm. i guess i'm more i used to no i still i'm not like a huge cheese person which people find like very odd really but i think i've gotten more i don't know it's it's the sharpness of it you don't like the sharpness? The sharpness. I don't know what it is. It's like a big turnoff for me. So I think we're good because I think this is kind of a soft. Yeah, piece. I think we'll be good with yeah. this. But yeah, like really, like when we went to uh, Italy with the Cuds trip. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. I got dude. a story about this one too. That, that, <laughs> oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, that, that cheese over there was just like, I had some. I was like, eh, no, I'm good. Yeah. So uh, when I went, so I went abroad and that was a lot of fun. I went to uh, Wageningen or however the g's they pronounce in dutch are a little strange it's like a kind of thing so it's like so were you in denmark or netherlands 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 yep yep i in netherlands and the funny thing about cuds was i was never in cuds um because mainly because whenever the trips happened i couldn't do them or i wasn't aware they existed yet like as a freshman i didn't know anything Mm -hmm. about cuds um but when i went abroad the first weekend I took one of those like cheap Ryanair flights down to Rome, and I kind of just partied with them for the weekend. Oh, you were you guys were both there at the same time? Yeah, exactly. Like I just started going. I just started abroad in the first week, and I'm like, I'll just take a quick trip down and meet everyone down in Rome. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it was like a sixty dollar airfare. Yeah, exactly. Dirt cheap. Exactly. It was like so cheap, <laughs> and so here I am. It's like. Hi, Mike. I'm I'm Carl. It's like, yeah, I know you are. <laughs> what do <are> you? <laughs> I'm here to party for a couple of days. That's all. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I was actually. It was kind of. It was pretty fun because, like, I wanted to go to Rome, and there, we, there we were. But yeah. So why don't you go into your abroad? Yeah. So uh, one of the main reason I went abroad in the Netherlands was because it was close to Germany, and I got a lot of family over there that I know quite well. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, like, when my Oma and Opa came over in the 1950s, my Oma did, really, like, like still maintain, like, a lot of contact with her sisters and brothers and things like that. So, uh, I, I really value that a lot because it's, like, really, it's really nice to have family in different parts. Um, so, I, I would spend a lot of my weekends going to visit them and doing things like that. I, I ideally maybe should have went to Germany for abroad, but, like, their, their schedules didn't align up so well, but... Yeah, I also went there because of Wageningen. A, it's a pretty good ag school. It's very similar to Cornell Cal's or like UC Davis and things like that. And so they had a lot. Of, they had some classes that were pretty good on um, with plant breeding and stuff like that. Some that weren't. 
I actually was taking one class. I, I forgot what year it was meant for, but I, I joined the, me and this Welsh, I forgot his name. Me and this Welsh guy, uh, were in this class and we we're like the only two people who are like, don't spoke, just spoke English. Like we're the only foreign students. And the professor was speaking in Dutch for a while. And then it's like, oh, I got to change to English now that these two students are in here. And then afterwards, I get an email or something like that. Could you leave the course? <laughs> because I want to talk in Dutch. Oh. <laughs> it was like, well, then. Oh, All yeah, right. Okay, yeah. All right. This is, this is how welcoming. Oh, yeah. Um, Don't try to be too. Uh... Yeah. So we ended up just taking this like impromptu course, which was actually kind of nice because like. All I would do in the morning is just sit on, sit on a computer trying to figure out this computer program, but I, I kind of got the VIP experience because I got to go behind what most students can only go to certain parts of campus, but me and this guy got our VIP access, so we were able to get like free coffee and things like that, and I think that's when my uh, liking for coffee started. <laughs> oh, you're a coffee headache now? Yes, unfortunately. Yeah, you're a slave to coffee. I mean... It, I do feel like if that that is kind of like it, I feel like that's something that would happen in Ithaca, maybe. Yeah, yeah. There's so many coffee options, like it's, it's, yeah, your yeah. couch on bagel and mm-hmm. all that. They just opened up a coffee shop like two blocks down from where I live in Fall Creek. Oh, did they? Yeah, so I could literally just walk to a place. It's it's not good. It's not good. It's not good for me. I love coffee. Love I, coffee. Oh, me too. I don't. I don't. I don't drink it. Maybe once a month. I go out for breakfast. Okay. I control myself, and it I, works real well if I need it. Exactly. I need <laughs> to learn to control myself better with it. But it, you know, it, it's useful. But anyways, <laughs> coffee, whatever, yeah. coffee. But yeah. So I went to the Netherlands. I, I didn't go by myself though. I had, well, not in Wageningen. I was by myself. But we 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 there was a crew of us. Um, there was a uh, Kyle was uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, what was the name of the place in England that a lot of people... Harper Adams, uh, Harper right? Adams, yeah. Yeah, so Andrew Kuhn, Nick Finn, they were in Harper Adams, so uh, we met up a couple of times. Hannah, Hannah Rinchi uh, was in Denmark and Copenhagen, and then Zach Hens was in Milan, so like... Wow, you had a lot of people. Yeah, so like we... There was a lot of weekends. We went to different places together, and it was pretty fun. That's pretty cool. Yep. I didn't realize all you guys were over at the same time. Yep, yep. Was Kyle in? Was he in the Netherlands as well? No, or? Kyle was in Edinburgh and in, in Scotland. Oh, okay. Oh, that that was probably that was one of my favorite weekends. Like, yeah. dude, if uh, I mean, I don't really get scotch now because it's expensive. But if you're gonna try scotch, that's the place to do it. It's the cheapest place. We went to the Scotch whiskey tasting experience, and oh, that was that was incredible. <laughs> my brother wants to go to Scotland real bad. Yeah, food's really good. Uh, I. Uh, I actually ice coon on top. There's a there's a there's a mountain called Arthur's Seat. It's kind of like a dormant. It's it used to probably be a volcano back in the day. I like ice coon on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> you carried an ice with you, Carl? Of course I did. Oh. <laughs> it was Kyle's. I think it was Kyle's idea. But I was like, yeah, we're gonna do it. Um. Yeah, that, that that was that that was yeah that was a lot of fun because and then uh, the the other cool thing I did was the last month I was supposed to be in Wagen and taking classes till June, but some of the courses I was, that were available weren't really that good, so I just kind of said screw it and I uh, just didn't take a class for the last semester and just traveled for a few weeks. Oh really? Yep. What did you have two? You were over there what? Uh, From Jan. So I was. Started in the beginning of January and uh, went there and was taking classes till the beginning of May. And then I was supposed to take class the last month and I just said, screw it. And I just uh, went around traveling places for three weeks. Hey, it's probably a better experience yeah. than you would have gotten. And, and like, uh, it, it was also like, but kind of by myself too. Like I, I just did it by myself. Kyle kind of encouraged me to do that. And I was, I was that was, that was a lot of fun because it could be a little terrifying just doing things on your own, but like it forces you to expose yourself and like on uh, things like that. So yeah, I, I, I do miss those days. They were quite fun. <laughs> I learned also a lot. Like I, I wasn't just like, uh, just partying all night and whatnot. I, 
no matter how I felt next morning, 9 a.m., I'd be in a museum for half the day, kind of learning things along the way. So I, I really enjoyed that. But yeah, traveling's fun. It sucks you can't really do it right now. <laughs> yeah, I think it should be here another month or so, yeah. or a couple months, PL2. But mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, that's what when I went abroad, I would yeah. come back and I'd talk to underclassmen. Yeah. And they'd say, Oh, I might want to go abroad. Do it. Do it. Absolutely. Do it. Like my thing was always, have you ever met someone who went abroad and said they hated it? No, no exactly. No, no, so no if you want to go abroad, yeah. just do it. Go it. You know, yeah, it's um, well worth it. I actually might have, if PowerPoint doesn't, no, we don't want to mess around with the PowerPoint since it's not working. But, um, so I was thinking, uh, Jason's uh, thing about going to Easter Island reminded me that I also was able to do a trip like that as well uh, through Cornell. Like everything, all expenses paid. Um, where we just went to Chile for a few di- for like eleven days. Oh really? Yep. And that was that was also quite, like an incredible experience. Was that through the, like the plant yep. plant science? Yep. Yep. What did you do in Chile? So uh, we the the whole point was kind of like a plant biodiversity. Um, tour so you're supposed to look at yeah plant biodiversity in chile since chile has a lot of plant biodiversity however when we got there a lot of it was a little more plant breeding focused which was great for me <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that that was that was an incredible experience because that's because all the places you go to like in from santiago which is the capital city we'd go on um, we went all the way down to valdivias which is a uh, kind of in southern chile it's it's um back in the days of colonialism the, it was actually one of the few places germany had so there's like a very big german influence there um yeah we just went all all over the place and like yeah it was an incredible experience um so many different kinds of plants um people are like incredibly hospitable and i would highly recommend (laughs) yeah so south america would be pretty cool Mm -hmm. select the right go to the right place yeah i (laughs) i guess i will say that uh chile is probably like probably the probably the most like well-to-do part of south america so to speak oh is it yeah i would say especially santiago so to speak yeah such a it's kind of neat because how it just it's that long sliver Mm -hmm. and you got all the 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 terrain must be nuts because you go from ocean to mountains exactly so if you go from west to east you can go from the ocean all the way up to the mountains which we did um and then but what's really incredible it's the north to south so we didn't go any north of santiago but in the north are the deserts and they're the driest places in the world and then if you keep going south it becomes more of like um patagonia you get down to Patagonia and there it rains all the time. So between the east and the west, from the coast of the mountains to the north of the desert and the south and Patagonia, there's like any, any kind of environment that you want. <laughs> yeah. And then of course that means that there's going to be so many diver- such a diverse amount of plants um, to look at too. So Yeah. Huh. That's pretty neat. Yeah. You forget it. It's just kind of that. Like I said, it's just that little dinky strip. You forget. Yeah, it's even but there. it's it's it is very long. It's yeah. yeah it's <laughs> cre- it goes. Does it go all the way? Almost goes to the south. The, yeah. the south tip, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, pretty close. Yep. So it basically, goes from north of the equator all the way down to. Uh, I think we are. No, I think it's still south of the equator. Is it just? Yeah, okay. it's, it's south of the equator. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's south. So yeah, that's the first time I've ever been in the southern hemisphere, <laughs> but. What other travel things? I've also been to Japan too. That was pretty fun. You went to Japan? I did. For what? Good question. Um, so uh, I was accepted. Once I got accepted to grad school, uh, I decided that, okay, I have a few weeks before I am bound to grad school life. <laughs> I went to Japan for three weeks. From, Just for the hell of it. Yep. Nice. Yeah, that was pretty fun. What did you recommend it yes oh highly if i would if you're gonna so like uh, places like europe kind of still are a little familiar to us because like our cultures are a little bit more similar right yeah that's where a lot of us came important another uh if i were to recommend to go any place that's like really different japan would be it because 
uh, the everyone's like very accommodating. It's like it's a very Japanese thing to be uh, a good host, so to speak. And so they'll help you, even though not everyone may know English and wouldn't really expect them to. They'll do anything they can to help you out to find your way where you're going. And there's no crime problems or anything like that. And so that would be like the one place I'd recommend to, for people to go if they're trying to experience something different. But also don't want to worry about other things that they might feel uncomfortable about. But but yeah, Japan was, Japan was really cool as well. Um, I kind of just did as much as I could in three weeks. That's a that's a long period of time. Three yeah. like f- from my perspective, like three weeks. That's a long time being in another country it, it for is. by yourself too. Yeah, yeah. Like not being abroad at a school, just yeah, going there yeah. to travel. That's yeah. a long time. Yep. That's cool though. Wow, I didn't know you did that. Yeah, it was. I, I'm very. I'm like. I'm very happy I did that, especially now with like. Like with based on like the pandemic, because like. Uh, you just never know when the, you can't do those things as much like because of things like right now. So you just take advantage of it when you can. And it's a, you know, I've always thought there's that. And people have told me you can either travel when you're young yeah, and you're out of college in, you know, and you aren't married, no kids, or you can wait till you're 60 and your kids are all gone yeah but then you're older so it's like yeah like it's, how it's, yeah i was just discuss- that sweet spot but in between you know i was discussing this with my housemates the other day actually about yeah this this balance of like um you 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 could like when you're yeah you save up money so you can retire early or something like that but then you're 60 yeah. whereas if you're like 22 you know how much you could get done in a day if you're a determined yeah. 20 or 2 year old? <laughs> all day and all night. All day and all night, <laughs> three weeks straight. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I have learned a lot. Um, but the other cool thing is, like, from those like, experiences, then you kind of have the bonus content of, like, I, I read quite a bit about, like, what's Japanese history like? Uh, what's uh, What are they doing now? And I, because I've been there, it's much easier to kind of pick up and read about it. And so I... I I kind of try and remember those experiences by like just kind of being more educated about places I've been. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's a big, for me, I've always said I've, I've never been a, I never really thought I'd ever go to like a, you know, like China or mm-hmm. Southeast Asia, but I always thought Japan would be yeah. a cool. Japan definitely. It someday. It, it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's maybe I'm biased, but it, it was a very easy, it was very easy to, um, get used to things because um japan is a a very unique place in the world just based on its culture there's nothing quite like it but there's also some aspects that would be familiar to us because like there is a significant amount of american influence particularly after the second world war Mm -hmm. so that makes sense yep how how are we doing i don't know i we're still on that. We're actually the the video feed's been on the pictures the whole time. All right, oops. <laughs> but that's not a bad thing, just because this thing is being laggy for some reason. Yeah, that's okay. Um, did you want to go into some of these other pictures? Oh yeah, let's keep going. So uh, yeah, let's. Uh, I just have a few pictures from my from my place. So uh, when I say when I get into plant science, like this this is kind of mm-hmm. why um, my parents are really really into uh, landscaping, and so kind of looks like a a coloring book so to speak <laughs> uh see that this is my this is my that's my house with all the all the wonderful plants and this is our family farm oh nice yeah is that are those uh barns or that's yep. just a, that's okay. the barns yep that's the barns that's that's our house right down there that's the barn that's next to our house and yeah so it's about 160 acres so do you guys still work that or do you run it out we kind of run it out yeah yeah plenty yeah. of other farms that yeah, probably want to fight over it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we just rent it out. It's usually it's like hay, wheat, and corn, uh, barley. Uh, yeah, that. <laughs> see, if we did barley, we would have to have our own equipment because you. Yeah, growing barley is tricky. It's it's not it's 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 not an easy crop to grow. It's getting better because we're learning more about how it grows and uh, when to apply the right time to apply nitrogen and, and fungicides. But yeah, it's it's still tricky. But yeah, that's 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 our family farm. Um, it's like 
it's always, I'm always like taken away about how lucky I am to grow up in a place like this, to have all these kind of opportunities. Cause I know that's not the case for everyone. So, or the case, especially for like, yeah, my grandparents who, um, when I'm 18 or 19, I'm at Cornell studying to, um, to help my career. But at that age, my, my opa, he was a prisoner of war, <laughs> a prisoner of war, like in, as a German with the Russians, and then he did, really. Oh yeah! What? Oh yeah! yeah Holy! Yeah. That must have. Wow! I should, I, I know a little history about the Russians and Germans, and it wasn't exactly. Yeah, pretty. I was gonna get into this beginning, wow. but I forgot. Um, Jeez. But yeah, so uh, my some both my open home and my dad's side um, were grew up in Germany in a place. It was called Prussia, but it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, where my Opa grew up is now Poland, where my Oma grew up is now Russia. And so they, they were born there. Um, my Oma was kind of part of this kind of uh, this family called the Fonder Goltz family. And they actually, they actually had a farm over there. So if we go back to how many generations my, f- my family's been farming, if we go <laughs> through my Oma, uh, I don't know where it began. The, 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 the records go back hundreds of years. So it's been, it's been a <laughs> while. Uh, and then my Opa grew up in this small, like, rural town. So uh, he was about 18 in 1943. So obviously, if you're an 18-year-old German in 1943, you're going to war. Yeah, that's <laughs> prime age. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, he was, he was, uh, he was fought for the Germans against the Russians. Um, obviously, they lost. Uh, and he was, happened to be the person that was defending he was on kind of like on an inlet and he just happened to be the person defending uh the the last ships to go so he was the one that got captured but uh interestingly enough he never really spoke that bad about the russian the the russians because uh sometimes over long story short the russian german conflict is far more uh, like ridiculous and gruesome than probably any other part of the war because there's it was just mass casualties between the nazis and then the russians with revenge and rightfully so it was (laughs) brutal yeah brutal um but a lot of the russian soldiers on the front lines were actually pretty well disciplined it was these like kind of like ragtag groups behind them that were from different parts of the soviet union that were kind of committing some kind of really bad atrocities because revenge was yeah. part of that. So, uh, my Opa got captured and he was on his way to Siberia and he, he, uh, first time he kind of like fled to the front cause he said he was going to go do something or something like that. And he chickened out and then he then did it again and he did it for good. So he like actually just fl- kind of he ran. got away from yeah, him. He got away from him. Yeah. Wow. And so he made it, he's like slowly made his way back to where he grew up and he kind of like hid outside the farm area. Um, then someone kind of reported him. So he had to like leave. Um, is this so, is this, the war is the war going was o- on. The, the war, war is over. over. The war is over. So the point. Russians are going after. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he was, uh, yeah, he had to hide in a foxhole for a while around the farms and things like that. And then he's slowly kept making his way eventually across the board, the West East German border. Okay. Yeah. Oh, back and to yeah. the Western yeah, part. Yeah, to the Western part. Cause and yeah. then, yeah, yep. the Soviets are no longer yeah. in yeah. control. And so for my, for my own, it was also, I mean, it was a really sad situation because the farm that their family was on for so long, they had to flee because the Russians were coming. And so, yeah, it was, it was kind of really, uh, really difficult for my like great one of my opie or my great grandpa because he had to like put down all the animals and things like that because he didn't want them to be tortured or whatever what have not and so they they fled um they had to hide quite a bit because they didn't kind of quite make it before the war was over and they had to do things like hide under hide in certain wagons they had to take boats across the baltic sea which was really risky at the time because it was a minefield right mm. and so i think either the boat after them or the boat f- before them hit a mine and so this has all been it's all like really close calls and when they made it to the east west german border it was 
the the wall was a little more developed. Like East Germans and the Soviets didn't want people fleeing to the West because you know more people for yeah communist yeah, yeah exactly. the communist state yeah yeah more people the communist state so like they had to be a little more careful but they eventually did cross as well and so my open oma once they met each other working at neighboring farms in i think holstein in northwest germany and they they fell in love um decided they were going to go to the u.s for better farming opportunities and that's where they came to western new york wow what a story yep wow that's yeah like you said we have no idea what mm-hmm. grandparents and stuff went through yeah so that we don't have to exactly go through that and then my grandparents on my mother's side um didn't i've been here since mid 1800s it's more of more like typical american story but yeah both of my grandparents didn't have much at all like growing up and so they saved a lot of money for their kids and then also for us um that's part of how my education got funded with because i had grandparents who cared about me before i was even born so yeah through all that that's what kind of like makes me make sure like i try to use take advantage of all the opportunities i can because like you don't yeah a lot of people put in the effort so i could be here yeah no that's a dude that's a great way to look at it mm-hmm. so i don't think enough people realize that or think that yeah when it, it's there's been a lot of sacrifices so we have what we have today exactly so i try to make the most of what i can but you know you know sometimes you fail you fall short but uh, that's how that's how it goes <laughs> yeah well hey at least what do they say you, you know you gotta at least you tried yep you never know what might happen if you don't don't take advantage of the mm-hmm. opportunity yep but yeah so that's but yeah through all that that's why how i still know quite a few relatives in germany because my only through all those experiences still didn't want to lose contact with the relatives so that's cool mm-hmm. so yeah do you know german much german no uh, i did take I, so there wasn't any german in any of the high schools most of them are too small um i did take a year of german in in college but if you don't use it you lose it yeah well I don't lose it. I, I do think I could pick up on the grammar again because once you learn, eh, it's very difficult to learn German grammar. But uh, I would have to go there for a while and be immersed in it in order to learn it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I understand. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm very envious of Michael's experience. Uh, Borman? Yeah. My, yeah. Yeah, he was lucky where he had the German in high school as well. Like mm-hmm. you said, you didn't have. And, and it sounds like his German, high school German was pretty good, good, or that's what he said. Because usually, like high school languages aren't uh, always spectacular. <laughs> yeah, my French certain my French <laughs> wasn't always the best. Our friend, for me, the French was pretty good. The Spanish was rough because the guy who spoke it was from the Dominican Republic, mm-hmm. and so he was fluent. And like people will say, sometimes it'd be like I was trying to teach someone English. Like, yeah, you don't know the nuances of why it's hard to learn english we just mm-hmm. were we grew up with it so yep. why don't you why can't you say this why, yeah, can't you why, why can't you just do that yeah, and but, so that was a problem he was kind of just like why don't you get this it's yeah. so simple and the kids are like uh they're getting stuck on stuff and, but yeah i really do want to learn german at some point because going deeper into this whole idea of like going abroad going to places like japan like learning a new language is kind of like a new way of thinking and so Having more perspectives, I feel, is like a better way to educate yourself and learn more and keep continuing learning and understand where people are coming from, like in different perspectives. So it's really why I do want to learn second language, hopefully German. But it right now it's like I sometimes I take take a gander at it, like, but yeah, there's there's too many things going on that I have to focus on at the moment <laughs> that makes German a little difficult, but there'll be you'll you'll have yeah you'll exactly. have opportunities exactly. you just got to do it mm-hmm. that's that's what I and that's the other thing yeah you just got you just got to do it yeah yeah you just gotta and have the motivation to keep doing it mm-hmm. but yeah uh you have any questions for me <laughs> so i always like to ask this i'm sure you've listened if you weren't doing research and all that what do you think you would be doing so i may have alluded to this but i actually initially uh probably when I was very young, I wanted to be a pilot, 
but then I couldn't because my eyesight wasn't the greatest. But what I'd really want to do, maybe knowing what I know now, is if it wasn't ag or it wasn't biology or anything in the life sciences, it'd be something with history. Yeah, something with history. Then, like, maybe tailor that to some kind of international relations scope and, like, do something in that regard. Yeah, all well, yeah. makes sense with all your traveling and going here yeah, and there. Yeah, I, I, I find just like different cultures fascinating. Like, and it's and it can it can be everything from the big things to like what are these philosophers like Enlightenment period on um, what governments have done and built to even the simple things like, I mean, craft brewing is kind of an American cultural thing as well. Like, developing a developing a product where it's like locally sourced and locally grown bringing people together talking about beer and things like this like this is all the part of the cultural experience too yeah i guess i never thought about that yeah. way yeah yeah i mean it doesn't have to be some fancy uh like culture isn't defined by some like fancy french wine and some <laughs> best some castle somewhere it can be as simple as just having a beer and um having a locally brewed beer and just talking about things like this. Yeah. No, I, yeah, no, I agree. Um, here's another question I just kind of thought about the other day. This is something I've never asked so far. It's kind of an out of the box question, but great. If, if you could, if you were, if someone was going to make a movie about you, about your life, who would you want playing? Who, what actor would you want to play you? So this is this is a very difficult question for me because I'm really bad at like picking out actors and I I'm, I'm pretty bad about paying attention to the names of actors and things like that so I'm not always the most knowledgeable in this subject but um hmm it's kind of a tough one it's kind of out there in left field yeah too. it's left field I just saw it the other day when I was cleaning the bar I'm like oh, that'd be a good question to ask yeah that would be a good <laughs> question because I don't know I'm trying to. I, I guess maybe I could describe so I guess it would have to be someone who's like doesn't f- can you think of like an actor that doesn't fit into like a group or I don't know that just does its own thing because that's how I feel like my life is sometimes I don't always fit into one box <laughs> um like I said I'm not the greatest with the whole Hollywood thing either but um I don't. I, I'll I don't, be honest. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't even know who I would choose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no clue. Hmm. I guess if people have any idea, write in the comments below, right? Yeah. That's what I'm supposed uh, to say. Yeah, exactly. If you have any suggestions for what actor could play me, please let me know. I, I'm both curious and scared to what the potential <laughs> comments might be if there are any. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, um, trying to think that's more or less anything else you want to talk about or are you, um, what else did, hmm, Do I, I don't think I have any more pictures. To... No, I don't. I'm good. Okay. Um, I, th- I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I have much else. I, I covered the basis on talk about how breeding works and everything like that um yeah uh feel free to you can put all the contact yeah you have email or whatever yeah i have email i'm making i'm making a little bit of a website oh really i'm it's it's not that impressive i guarantee hey (laughs) it's uh it's literally just a link that has like hey this is what i do and that's it okay (laughs) Well, well, yeah, I'll put that in there. Yeah, but, send all that to me. I'll throw it in the description yep. for the Spotify and YouTube mm-hmm. so people can go to it. Yep. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, yeah, shoot them Carl's sh- way. Shoot them my way, and I will try to answer them as quick as I can. Maybe in the summer won't happen as much. Cause, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, for like all I, farmers who are kind of yeah. busy that time of the year. Actually, yeah, I... I received good news today that Cornell is actually letting, I think is going to let us hire some undergrads for work, which we didn't have. We had like one person for half the year last year. And that was, that was difficult. <laughs> they can do all the kind of underling work. I mean, the thing not about, that it's not under, it's just not underling. Cause there's two things to that one, I was once that person. So I feel <laughs> like I have authority in saying what they can do and whatnot Two, like, 
I don't like telling people to do something that I wouldn't do myself. So like, I'll do it with them, but I appreciate the help. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there are some things they do that I don't because I have to do other things. But yeah, you, yeah, you don't have the time. Yeah, exactly. But like, I, I'm not, I'm not gonna be like, hey, go weed my plots, and then not do it. No, I'm gonna be there too doing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, but. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, Carl, my man, dude, this is awesome. Yeah, thank you for thank, having me on. Thanks for coming out, and uh, yeah. I guess we'll enjoy some more pretzels and bread and cheese. Yeah, we didn't open the cheese yet. Wow. Oh, that's okay. We're gonna have it now. Yeah, we can have it now. <laughs> um, thanks everyone for watching, and yeah, if you have any questions, uh, Carl's information will be down down below. And uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next episode.